stars of liberty. And we spent the whole night discussing what we should do from a revolutionary viewpoint, without giving ourselves any false illusions about escaping death. But what was the best thing for the cause we had all defended? Should we give ourselves up or kill ourselves? This was the last-minute dilemma, what we were debating that last night. These were the two points of view. Emile said, this was a comrade called Mario Emile, he said, I'm not sparing them any crimes. If they want me dead, they'll have to kill me. Nobody on the quayside slept that night. Through the darkness of March 31st, this macabre debate was argued to its conclusion. Many agreed with Guthman's friend to stay alive and let the enemy take the ultimate guilt. But others made suicide pacts. Eduardo de Guthman recalls the last two to die. After that last discussion, when we were about to leave, they took each other by the hand and saying, this is our last protest against fascism, they raised their pistols to each other's heads and shot each other. As we were leaving the port, somebody said, we'll soon be envying the dead. And I thought, no, we'd better start envying them now. Few today remember that Alicante port was the place of the Republic's last agony. Nearly three years after the army insurrection, the war was over. The guns fell silent. The church bells began to ring. Over the radio, a nationalist announcer delivered Franco's final war communique. In the day of today, cautivo and disarmed the Red Army, han alcanzado las tropas nacionales sus últimos objetivos militares. La guerra ha terminado. Burgos, primero de abril de 1939, año de la victoria. El generalísimo Franco. April 2nd, 1939, the day after the war's official end, was Palm Sunday. In Madrid, Generalissimo Franco went to lay a sword of victory in the Church of Santa Barbara. It was the first of many triumphal occasions in which Franco and Spain celebrated the nationalist victory. What would Spain be like under Franco? The fighting was over, but the so-called national crusade had a long way to run. Spain was to be transformed, but into an image of the past. Out of the turmoil of the Republic, the Spain of history was to be resurrected, ruled once more by the church, the oligarchy, the great landowners. There was to be a fatherland at once new and ancient, a nation united, obedient, purged of evil. Franco decreed, retroactively, that all who had opposed the nationalists would be answerable. Even pre-war political opponents were not to be spared. He saw the main threat in the working class, once triumphant, now prostrate. Here, the purge must be most harsh. It began at once, among the new hordes of his captives. Nobody suspected of Republican sympathies was safe. Concentration camps all over Spain were swamped by hundreds of thousands of prisoners. The captives from the harbour at Alicante were brought here to this barren place, which was then the concentration camp of Albatera. It is said that Franco personally ordered that there should be no photographs of the camp. When it had served its purpose, Every trace of it was cleared away. All that remains today is an old hut used by the guards and a path once trodden by 30,000 arriving prisoners. But the camp 
can never be clear from the memories of those who survived Albatara. The repression began right from the start. We were never considered human beings. That's the way it was under Franco. We were always considered as things, never as human beings. Albatera was not just an internment camp. It was also a camp where people awaited selection for execution. Through the gate which used to stand here, the visitors arrived. These were the moments of terror, for these visitors were members of the Falanque, who came to identify their enemies. They were looking for people from their towns, or anyone else of note, anyone who'd been a volunteer or fought in the Republican army, or anyone who'd been mayor or any other official in any Republican town in Spain. And they picked these people out right there and then. This one, this one, this one. And without more ado, just took them off. They took them away to their respective villages. But most of the time, these prisoners never reached their destination. What usually happened was that we heard the shots from here, and that was the end of them. There were also executions within the camp. The prisoners were forced to watch them. I remember the first executions. I'd been locked up in the punishment area. So there were three lads that they shot. They'd lined us up at machine gun point. And one of the lads, a commissar, said to everyone, keep calm, comrades, don't make a move, they'll use it as an excuse to kill us all. And they shot him right there in front of us. Nobody knows how many of the 30,000 who went into Albatera perished by execution or just callous neglect. Most people know what the Nazi extermination camps were like. They've seen films of them. I think that the Albatera camp was in many ways like those extermination camps, except it was less systematic. Everything here was less organized. In the concentration camps, persecution was still haphazard. But soon, the policy of systematic repression began. The prison population increased by over 200,000 people. There were token trials, rapid sentences, executions. The terror lasted at this pitch for more than four years, longer than the war itself. Many, like Narciso Julian and Eduardo de Guzman, suffered for much longer. Both were sentenced to death. Eduardo de Guzman spent nine years in prison. He and Narciso Julian, like many others, waited to be executed for over a year, never knowing if the next day was to be their last. Narciso Julian was to spend 25 years in prison. This part of the prison yard, the Jezarias, still holds special memories for him. In 1945, he met his daughter there. In 1965, 20 years later, he met his granddaughter in the same spot. But for nationalist families, the suppression of all dissent meant unity. Tomas Garicano Gogne, later one of Franco's ministers, found a solid logic in Franco's persecutions. <laughs> 